How's everybody doing for a, a Monday? Okay. Doing all right? Week nine, you ready for the home stretch? Okay, well, we'll get going since it is, um, it's not one, it's one for me, it's three for you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've got a cough, I'm fighting pneumonia, um, on antibiotics, steroids, all that stuff. So you're just going to have to bear with me. Um, I appreciate everybody's flexibility with um, rescheduling or attending different classes last week. I know it was kind of hectic. Um, okay, let's get these people in. So a uh, couple of things. I set out, sent out a couple of announcements last night. I want to make sure you guys have had a chance to take a look at it. If you haven't, please do. Um, one is your PESI schedule. Okay, did everybody see that attachment? I made a mistake on the Pensacola one. I think I put like Monday 620. It's actually Tuesday 620. So I apologize for that. I sent out an announcement earlier. Um, so that is when all the campuses for, uh, PN have their HESIs. So it's simply a, a schedule for you. I don't do anything with that schedule except provide it to you. Um, it is up to you to schedule your HESIs on your campus. However, that is done. Does that make sense? Um, Tuesday at what time? Because oh, it's I still the same time. Tuesday. I just had the wrong day down there. It's for for what campus? Pensacola. Okay, I have okay. a class on Tuesday. Yeah, um, I, I I had on the paperwork Monday six twenty at eleven a.m. The only difference is it's Tuesday six twenty. Okay. okay. I'll Tuesday be in class. Well, there's no class that week. You're taking Hesse's. Okay, no class that week. Okay. Right. Right. Um, yes. No class that week. It, classes are over. You're taking HESI. So okay, okay. So your job now is to schedule your HESI. Has anybody scheduled a HESI yet? It may be too early. I don't know. Um, anyway, you have the dates. You have the date and the time, and so you should also be getting communication from your uh, campus as well. So I was just trying to they. Uh, Dean Brown just provided us that over the weekend. So I thought I'd share it with you to give you guys a heads up. Okay. You. Um, have you received information on your other HESIs? Yeah. Okay. All right. So your jo job over the next couple of weeks is to get those scheduled. Okay. The other, <laughs> the other announcement I sent <clears throat> yesterday was a roadmap. Everybody get that? Or it's in it's in your announcements if you haven't seen it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, so I just want to review that. There's your HESI schedule, and then I sent you an updated Pensacola. So this this roadmap goes through the next four weeks. All right. And so uh, please, please take a moment to look at it. OK, because it has a lot of good information in there and I want to point out the attachments. OK, so this is week nine, obviously. This is our last week of lecture. OK, so today we'll be covering um, human abuse and violence and then cultural influences in nursing. OK, so we're going to go through that content. But then I would like to spend the rest of the class going through the study guide, going through the exam three study guide. Does that make sense? Um, it's not a, um, this isn't a substitute for attending a review, but since I, there's so little attendance because everybody's so busy, I thought that I would spend some time doing the study guide. Sound good? That will be our activity today, okay? Um, let's see. So this week is lecture. 
or um, the last week of um, sorry, still letting people in last week of content. Okay. This week, you also have an NCLEX question, NCLEX set, right? Do Sunday. You have a HESI case study, which is domestic violence and cultural competency. That's due this week, this Sunday. And that goes along with the content from this week. And then remember your, your HESI who did I just let in? Sorry, guys. Hang on. Who just came in? Randy came in. Mm -hmm. did... Randy's here. Elena was already here. Let's see. Sorry. Okay. Um, we're still missing several students. So I'll watch for them. Um, so this week is a busy week. Um, and, you know, hang on. This week is a busy week. As I told you in week one, once we get after week eight, things get busy for you guys. Right. So this week we have uh, our HESI prep assignment, which is due by Sunday. OK, and again, make sure you're using the HESI prep document that I provided to you in the announcements in week one. OK, do not be using the one in your module from week nine. It's not the updated one. You're going to end up doing a whole lot more work than you need to. So and I've said that several times over the term. Please, please use the one from week one. OK, it's a more current more condensed HESI prep. And it actually has the current topics that have been on the HESI for the last three terms. Okay, the one from week nine, the, the link from week nine is the old extended version. I'm trying to get re that removed. All right, so um, your HESI prep assignment is due by Sunday. And that's what you'll use to study for your HESI. All right, for your HESI, you'll use your three exam study guides and this HESI prep assignment, okay? This week we have um, live reviews. Let's just open that one up. I have two attachments at the end of this message. One is the review schedule, okay? So uh, the reviews uh, for exam three are, uh, Professor Ford has already done hers. She did hers last week, I'll send the announcement. Um, Professor Kershaw's is 6-8, uh, which is Thursday. And then I moved mine from Wednesday. Mine was Wednesday at noon, um, but um, a lot of students are in class or at clinicals. So I've moved mine till Sunday night, if that helps. Hopefully it helps. Okay, so there's your three exam, well, two exam reviews. I'll send you, send you the recording of Professor Ford's. Okay, um, so that's this week. And then next week um, is exam week. Um, so it'll be exam three and you go right in from exam three right into HESI. So then next week, your vulnerable populations assignment is also due. <laughs> and we tend, so between this week, this Sunday and next Sunday, you have 10% of your homework grade due because each of the assignments is worth 5%, the big assignments, okay? So please, please be turning that win, turning those in. And the schedule at the end of your, um, at the end here that I just opened up, I just wanted to point out, sorry, I should have, is in blue is the HESI review. So in week 10, you have an exam, all right? So there's no time in class to go through a HESI study um, session. And so the three of us have scheduled additional time for a HESI review during week 10. Okay. Makes I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you said you changed your Wednesday review at 12 PM. You changed it to Sunday. Yeah. It's right here. In Cause yellow. I was going to attend the Wednesday one. Um, yeah. Because I have leadership. Yeah. That Sunday oh, oh. Is 
You know what, Nicole, a lot of students, Dean provided me the, the overall schedule. The 60% uh, of the campuses have clinicals or class that day. So um, I was asked to be a little bit more flexible and offer, offer a different time. So yes, I have changed it to Sunday evening. So okay. that's why that happened. I was trying to be more accommodating to students who um, would not be able to make it Wednesday due to clinicals or class. Okay. Okay. And so anyway, in blue, guys, please look at this to see if you can fit any of these in next week. I know it's exam week. I know it's busy, but here's your HESI if you want to go to a HESI review. Okay. So that's week 10. Um, let's see, vulnerable populations, there'll be HESI reviews. To prepare for your HESI, use your study guide to review your key concepts. Remember prior, prioritization. Then week 11 is your HESI, okay? But don't forget in week 11, you have your last NCLEX. So you may wanna get that done sooner rather than later so that you don't forget about that, okay? And the other, the other attachment that I attach to this roadmap is the HESI guidelines, because everybody's always asking when they get their HESI, how much remediation do I need to do? I don't know if you guys have seen this document, but these are your HESI remediation guidelines. Okay, you can take a look at the top part, it explains why reme remediation is important, but here's the HESI required hours. So if you score between an eight and an 849, you're gonna to have to do three hours of remediation. Okay, if you score seven to 749, five hours. Okay, so, so these are the required hours. All right, we can talk about that as it gets closer. And then week 12, a um, couple of things that happen in week 12. As soon as, you're as soon as you take your HESI in week 11, I would highly suggest you get going with your remediation. Okay, you remediate, all remediation is due by Monday, June 26th. Okay, no, and there's no exceptions for that. So again, I would encourage you to get going as soon as you get your packets. Does that make sense? Don't wait till Monday to do it. So questions about the roadmap. So we've got weeks 9, 10, 11, 12, all lumped together. I thought it'd be helpful to just give you a roadmap for those four weeks. Questions? Okay. I'm seeing Brittany. Did Brittany come in? I see Ty. Ty, where are you? I can't see you. It's just a blurred screen. Tawanda's not here and Temu's not here. Virginia, you're here. Tyan, uh, you have a blurred screen. Um, stay on after for a minute, Tyan, okay? Please. Um, so do you guys have any questions for the next four weeks? You have everything you need. I hope you've been working on these assignments. The one due Sunday, HESI prep and vulnerable populations next Sunday. I hope you've been working on those. Um, okay, so let's cover some content today and then we're gonna go through and cover, look at the study guide. Okay, I'm gonna go to your week nine notes. Um, I actually want to, oops. Take that back. I'm going to go to the book real quick. The um, book, the book has a really, really good. This is a really good chapter on um, cultural competence. Okay, it's chapter fourteen in your fundamentals book. Okay, and per your module, you're required to read. I'm written. Do 
187 through 189 and 193 through 200. Okay. So let's go through that. Okay. So when we talk about cultural and spiritual aspects, aspects of patient care, can you guys please articulate for me why cultural competency is so critical in our nursing profession? What is cultural competency? What is culture? Just knowing about people's culture and being like cautious of their beliefs and things like that and not having like a, um, a biased standpoint so you can provide the same amount of care for all of your clients. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Kadishia. Anybody else? Why is culture important? Well, as we know that in our interactions <laughs> as nurses, we are working with or will be working with numerous different cultures. Okay. What is culture? Set of values, beliefs, assumptions about life that is maintained by a certain group of people. Okay. Culture includes learned behaviors, beliefs, attitudes, norms, practices. So we always want to try and incorporate cultural values, beliefs, practices into our plan of care with different cultures. I'd like for you to understand the difference between religion and religiosity and spirituality. Can anybody tell me the difference? I mean, they're often used interchangeably, but they do have a, um, they're very different concepts. So spirituality is the big picture. Okay, a deeply subjective experience in which, how you see the overall picture of the higher power, right? Well, your relationship to the wholeness of the physical and non-physical world, all right? And what the meaning is for one's life. So that's the big picture, spirituality. So religiosity or religion is one form. Uh, religion is a formalized system or belief in worship. Okay, so it's a particular religion. Okay. Faith, atheist, agnostic. Okay, so it's whatever the religion is. So please understand the differences between <clears throat> both of those. Some major religions um, across the United States and Canada, Christianity. I just want you to know what they are. Um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. Okay. Here's a chart on that right here. This is actually an interesting chart. Here's all the different um, common religions across the United States and Canada, okay? And, and look at the, uh, this is an example of dietary practices. Really interesting, okay? Developing cultural competence, okay? What is cultural competence, okay? Cultural competence is basically knowing ourself, examining our own values and beliefs, our attitudes, our prejudices, all right? It involves us trying to keep an open mind and trying to see the world from a different cultural perspective. Does that make sense? We work, I mean, I've been in nursing 40 years this month. I've worked my entire nursing career starting 40 years ago, developing cultural competence. It's an ongoing life process, okay? You are not expected to know about every single culture, every single, every single value, belief, practice, 
norms that come along with every culture. But as you continue along the path of your nursing career, you will learn about different cultures. Okay? It's actually very rewarding. Um, what I've done to educate myself about different cultures is talk to the clients. When I was in school nursing, talk to the parents, talk to the kids. And we try our best to incorporate parts of their culture into whatever the health plan is for the kids at school or the health plan is for the patient at the hospital. Okay? So cultural competence is key, okay? What are some cultural barriers, okay? So some of the barriers are stereotyping. I'm just going through this quickly because this is in our notes and I want to go to our notes. Uh, another barrier is prejudice, ethnocentrism, maybe cultural imposition, cultural conflict, and cultural shock. Okay, does anybody work with or know people that are have a hard time incorporating different cultures into their practice? Yep, I know for sure. Absolutely. And what happens? It's not that comfortable, honestly. Me as a Puerto Rican, it's hard for me sometimes when they're like, oh, uh, so you're not like from here. And I'm like, well, I'm not from here, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be less of a person or less of an employee just or because of that. Right. right. What do what do we what are some differences, cultural differences? So different cultures present different views of communication, time perception, personal space, family and social gatherings, social organizations, nutritional practices issues related to death and dying and healthcare beliefs, right? So we have to be cognizant of all the different differences within the cultures, okay? And then the rest of the chapter goes through all these different ones, communication, view of time, okay? So the, it's important to know what areas that we may be looking at that all cultures may be different. Okay, here's an excellent, excellent uh, chart, 14.3, common cultural values, practices, and beliefs. The two I want you to focus on for the exam are Hispanic and American Indians. Okay, those are the two I really want you to have a good sense of understanding of common cultural values, practices, and beliefs. Not that the others aren't important, but there are going to be questions geared towards those two particular cultures. All right. I think that was what I wanted to pull out of that chapter. Oh, this is a really good, if I, I would encourage you to go back and read this section. It begins on 198. Okay, this is how we've talked about all term about how we apply the nursing process and the clinical judgment model in transcultural nursing. No, we've talked about all term how to apply the nursing process and clinical judgment model, the ADPI, into all the different topics we've been covering. Okay, this is an excellent section on nursing process clinical judgment as it relates to transcultural nursing. So it goes through ADPI assessment, data, data analysis, collection, planning, implementation. So I would highly suggest you have a look at that section. Um, it is part of your reading. Um, your reading goes up to, uh, yeah. So this is included in your reading. So please have a look at that. I wanna go and look at um, our week nine notes and talk a little bit more about cultural inf influences. So if you haven't had, has anybody had a chance to read your week nine notes? 
Okay, so culture is everything we believe to be true in the world, right? We've already talked about a bit of this. It's our, it's your set of values, beliefs, assumptions about life that we pick up through socialization and childhood. Different ethnic groups may have different, may have cultural similarities, but we're all unique because we grew up differently. Okay, cultural encompasses a wide variety of behaviors including language, touch, personal space, body language, perceptions of health and illness. Culture also affects family structure, childbearing practices, time orientation, eye contact, right? So as nurses, and this is really important right here. Nurses must approach each patient as completely unique and learn the patient's culture through observation and assessment. And I would add to that by also asking the client or the patient about their culture. Let them explain to you what their culture is, what their values and beliefs are. It's fine to observe and assess, but you know, a, a conversation is also extremely appropriate. One of the first things we need to do is have an understanding of our own cultural beliefs. Because based on our own cultural, cultural beliefs, we don't want to be passing on judgment or doing any kind of stereotyping. Whoops. Some examples of cultural variations among common ethnic groups in the US. We just talked about that. We just talked about table 14.3. So please go back and review that. As nurses, we always wanna maintain an open and, objective, open and objective attitude towards individuals and their cultures. We wanna avoid seeing people, seeing individuals as alike. Be aware again of our own beliefs, avoid projecting those beliefs onto others. <clears throat> cultural awareness is part of cultural competence. What is cultural awareness? Really important. Cultural awareness is the self-examination and exploration of our own biases and prejudices. Nurses who lack cultural knowledge and competence may feel in inadequate or helpless. Cultural competence is huge in our profession, huge. So how do we develop cultural competence? A couple of ways. Be sensitive to the cultural implications during each, each encounter. Avoid stereotyping based on race and ethnicity. Ask questions to stimulate learning about the client's culture. Avoid making assumptions about the nonverbal cues from clients or unfamiliar from unfamiliar cultures. Okay. Questions about culture. Give me some examples. Give me some examples that you've had in your own experience about having to um incorporate different cultures into your practice what have you done um excuse me yeah um your week nine notes i think they're locked because it says access to my because i tried to print them out yesterday and so oh. i went back and clicked through it and it's still says okay. access to my i'll resend those after class Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for bringing that up. So tell me about culture in your own jobs and your own practice. How do you, how do you, um, how do you engage culture, different cultures into your practice? Tyan, your screen is blurred and Angelique, I can't see you. So tell me about culture. Really, it's a very important topic. So I want to have a discussion about culture. I've never really had the experience to embrace like different cultures in my work environment. Now that I think of it, like I can, I can't think of a time where I incorporated that. 
What, what I've kind been of STNA for 10 years? I'm an STNA. <laughs> really? That's why okay. I'm like, I can't think of the time that I had to like. Mm -mm. And so do you work in what kind of institution do you work in? I work um, like it's a veterans nursing home. Okay. Yeah. And so you've just had one culture all along. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Like, okay. Wow. That's that's I've worked at a bunch of them though, but never where they were really like culturally or that we had to do anything extra for them. Okay. I can't remember of time. Huh. Okay. Anybody else? I work with a lot of Nepali. Okay. Um and a lot of theirs is like dietary needs. They mm -hmm. are big on like the white rice and a lot of vegetables. So if you're ordering trays for them or helping them, you have to kind of be aware. Mm -hmm. And then they also can't really, un they can't understand you for the most part. So we use the translator cards and uh, pictures for the menus. Okay, excellent. I work excellent. in a hospital and I'm like, I have a lot of everything, but lately this, there's been a lot of Hispanic population and it's, you know, in, from my point of view, it's good because obviously I speak Spanish, but, you know, some of the nurses, if I, if they know that I'm on the floor, they're like, hey, come here, I got a Spanish patient, or normally they just assign me those Spanish speaking patients just okay. for the fact because that I'm going to be able to communicate with them. And they want to make sure that, you know, every needs is met and, you mm -hmm. know, try their best to do what they need to do. Because mm -hmm. the, the little thingy, like the little computer translator, nine times out of 10 is not accurate. Okay. So what in particular, is there any particular practices that you have incorporated with that, with the Hispanic culture that you wouldn't do for other clients? Well, Hispanics are more like, oh, I need to be uh trust, trusting of you before I can open up like we had an Spanish patient like a week ago um she just moved like she just literally crossed the border and um she had like a really big sore on her breast um they thought it was cancer but it was like a flesh eating bacteria that she got from apparently one of the rivers that she had to cross for coming here but she didn't want to say that to the social services through the like the little thingy and you know when I try to speak with her and all that she like she developed like a trusting relationship and she opened up we even found out that she um was abused from her you know her partner uh, was abusing her so she ran away and um she ended up in the hospital because of uh, severe pain on the breast. And, you know, we, we I was able to like get so much information just for the fact that she was trusting me because I was Hispanic also. Yeah, that's such a great example. That's such a great example of incorporating, you know, our nursing strategies to learn about different cultures. That's great. That, that's an awesome story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, who else has dealt with different cultures and how has that impacted your nursing care? I worked in Charlotte on an ambulance and we would get called to the airport frequently. Mm -hmm. And in one encounter, I had a Muslim family that were coming over and she was pregnant. So uh, my partner, which was a man, couldn't be in the room when I evaluated her, uh, nor ride in the back of the truck with her on the way to the hospital. Yep. Yep. That, that's a great example as well. What else? You guys have to have more examples. Have you had any? I know you've been a nurse for 40 years, so you probably have all the experience and all the stories. Oh my gosh. Um, 
in the schools, I had a lot of experience with different, depending on the neighborhood of the school. I learned, uh, I had a school, well, I had numerous schools, but I learned a lot about the Somali population. I learned a lot about the Muslim population. I learned a lot about the Hispanic population. And as I went through and was working with these different cultures, it helped me when I had to work with this culture again. And in schools, we were dealing with vaccination status. And a lot of these cultures don't believe in vac you know, vaccinations. Um, I had a school that had a fairly significant um, population of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and so I, I've been exposed to a lot of different cultures. Um, we had, um, uh, we have, well, I'm not there anymore, but um, a Haitian population, a Nicaraguan, Nic Nicaraguan population. You know, think about the schools. I mean, you've got kids from everywhere everywhere. And so I was on the learning curve my entire 20 years. It was fascinating to learn about different cultures. It was fascinating, you know, and, and I would help educate the staff on different values, beliefs, practices, what we can do, what we cannot do. COVID was a huge struggle with different cultures, with all of the um, restrictions that were in place. Um, huge struggles. So it's been really, um, I mean, I'm still working on my cultural competence, but I believe at, up to this point, I'm, I'm very culturally competent and have just uh, acquired a, a huge amount of knowledge about different cultures. It's really, it, it's a lifelong process and it will be in your nursing career. So and I'm big on cultural competence is one of my favorite topics to talk about because now going back, you realize how important it is. I mean, it, there's always been different cultures in my nursing practice over 40 years, but it hasn't been not taken seriously. That's the wrong word, but it, different cultures, we haven't always incorporated the specifics of the culture into healthcare. We are much more focused on doing that now over the last 10 years, I would say, seven to 10 years. And so it is challenging to incorporate values and beliefs and, and practices and food choices, but that is the way our society is right now. We are a very multi, multi-diverse culture and Everybody deserves to be, everybody, every family deserves to be treated as a unique individual. And we try and incorporate as much of we as much as we can about their values and beliefs and practices into their health plan. That's being culturally competent. And yes, you're going to work with people that are either don't want to be culturally competent or would prefer to have things that status quo and why do we have to do this and why do we have to do that? Well, our nursing profession is leading us into a direction has been for a while of cultural competency. It's part of our job. Okay. Let's talk about human violence and abuse. Okay, there's no particular chapter in your, well, there was in the med surge book, but the chapter was more about dealing with shock and trauma of kind of physical injuries. Let's have a discussion about <clears throat> human abuse and um, violence. What kinds of, what kinds of violent, well, let me preface this by saying, over the course of your nursing career, you, you will be working with victims of violence perpetrators of violence, people who have witnessed violent acts. Doesn't matter where you work. Okay, so we have to have an understanding of human violence. Okay, what kinds of violence are we talking about? What's violence? What might you see? 
I would say domestic. Domestic. Domestic Child violence. Abuse. Child abuse. Child abuse. Intimate partner violence. Um, neglect from the elderly. Neglect. Neglect at any age. Yeah. I think of assault. Harassment. What rape about victims. what else? I said rape victims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do we know about human trafficking? Is that a form of violence? Have you talked about human trafficking in any of your other courses? Human trafficking is on the rise to levels that we've never seen before. Right? What about self-inflicted violence? Say suicide. Still a form of violence. Okay, so you're going to be exposed to all of this. Again, victims, perpetrators, people who have witnessed violence. Okay, let me go back to my notes here. Oops. So here's what your notes say. Violence is a maladaptive coping mechanism. It's common and it's very common in vulnerable populations, right? Just like substance abuse. It's a, a, a means of exhibiting or regaining control. It's predictable, thus preventable. If we look at both victims and perpetrators. Okay, we do know that the high levels of violence are certainly, certainly related to health disparities and adverse health outcomes. I mean, think about it. Think about just chronic disease for a minute. Chronic disease causes uh, physiological conditions, but examples, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, hormonal disruption. We know that we all know that we are mandatory reporters, right? What does that mean? What does that mean? If you know something that you have to report it if it's done to someone. Mm -hmm. What is that just at work? No, you have to also the authorities or the person that's overseeing them mm -hmm. for protection. Mm -hmm. Any place we see potential abuse, right? Whether it's at the grocery store or your next door neighbor. We're mandatory reporters of violence against children and elder, elderly or vulnerable adults. Okay. Think about what ch children are very, very high risk uh, for vulnerabilities um, that have been exposed to violence. You know, children may be exposed to violence. They may be victims of violence or witness it. They're very high risk for mental disorders, self-harm, substance abuse, and committing suicide. Okay. Uh, we know in general, abuse is about power and control. And all these methods of control. Okay. Generally family violence, is, vi is violence of the most powerful against the least powerful. Family violence is perpetuated in a cycle as children grow up, seeing violence used as a method of control over children and their mother. We know that abused children are more likely to perpetuate violence or to tolerate violence in their own relationships as adults. We also know that families living in economic strain, poverty, or dealing with a crisis, maybe an unplanned pregnancy, unemployment issue, marital issue, infidelity, are more likely to experience violence. 
Social isolation contributes to violence with reduced social support leading to the family's ability to cope with crises. We saw that over the last three years with the pandemic. Social isolation. The violence across our country at the moment is massive. Okay, elder abuse is a type of family violence. We're responsible for uh, assessing and reporting that as well. Elder abuse can come in many, many forms of violence. Emotional abuse, controlling behaviors, financial abuse. We know that victims of violence do exhibit symptoms. In particular, kids are prone to frequent headaches, stomach aches, bedwetting, anxiety, depression, withdrawal behavior, inappropriate sexual behavior or knowledge, and maybe precocious puberty or delayed puberty, menstrual disorders. That's for children. Women, abused women are prone to chronic headaches, palpitations, sleep and appetite disturbances sexual dysfunction, irritable bowel syndrome, right? Urinary, vaginal infections. They typically experience more miscarriages, preterm babies or low birth weight babies. And we also know that abuse generally increases or escalates during pregnancy. So when we suspect any kind of abuse in an adult, okay? We ask directly in a non judgmental way to give, give that person the opportunity to report without feeling shame. And then we know the elderly, we touched upon a little bit, but they're at risk for any kind of violence, really physical, emotional, financial, and neglect. What does that look like? Emotional abuse may, may look like they're being treated, they're being demeaned to affect their self-esteem, maybe name calling, scaring the client, embarrassing them, destroying their property, not letting them see family and friends. And we know that neglect occurs when the basic needs are not met. Basic needs for food, housing, clothing, medical care are not met and maybe they're abandoned you know, the caregiver leaves the client alone no longer provides for him and then we've all heard examples of horrible 